Good day, everyone. This is Jack Van Horn from the University of Southern California, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Big Data to Knowledge Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science. Uh, today, March 30th, 2018, we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Curtis Huttenhauer from uh, Harvard University's uh, Chan School of Public Health to discuss molecular data and the microbiome. Uh, Dr. Huttenhauer is an Associate Professor of Computational Biology and Bioinformatics at uh, Harvard uh, Chan School of Public Health, and he's an Associate Member at the Broad Institute. He was an Analysis Lead on the NIH's Human Microbiome Project, and he currently leads the Human Microbiome Bioactives Resource, where his lab focuses on computational methods for functional analysis of microbial communities and the micro uh, and microbiome epidemiology. We're absolutely delighted to have him presenting his work today, uh, again, on the topic of molecular data and the microbiome. During his presentation, I encourage uh, our audience members to uh, submit any questions that you may have for Dr. Huttenhauer by using the little question submission facility as part of the GoTo um, webinar uh, uh, little panel, uh, usually on the right-hand side of your screen. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Dr. Huttenhauer to uh, uh, begin his presentation. Thank you so much, Curtis, for uh, presenting today. Excellent. Likewise, thanks, Jack, everyone there who, who organizes, um, and everyone who's attending. I'm, I'm very pleased that the technology can, can bring such a great group of people together. Um, hopefully, I'm audible at this point. You are. Excellent. Okay. Well, with that, as, as Jack said in the, the very kind introduction, um, the group here works on uh, microbial community and human microbiome studies with a, a computational focus. And this, of course, addresses questions of how the collection of microbes we carry in and on our bodies, bacteria, fungi, viruses, um, other types of microbes, affect our health outcomes. Um, so I'll speak today both about uh, some of the ways in which this affects public health um, and of the, the accompanying computation and, and data science challenges. And it's easy to forget after the, the past few years' worth of interest in the microbiome um, that it's actually been studied for quite a long time. Some of the earliest microscopy done by Van Leeuwenhoek actually resulted in imaging of his own human microbiome with microbes isolated from his oral microbial community. As somebody who sits at a, a school of public health, though, perhaps some of the more, more urgent reason to study the microbiome is the rise in chronic, non-pathogenic, but immune-linked disease over the past several decades. So collections of diseases like type 1 diabetes or inflammatory bowel disease, which I'll, I'll speak about today, that um, are affected by our immune system's interaction with our typical microbial environment, but which are not caused by a specific pathogen like, like an infectious disease. And the microbiome has now been linked to a really surprising range of, of chronic disease, um, not just gut-centered conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, but systemic ones like type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, or even behavioral conditions like autism. And it's easy to imagine over the past, say, 75 years, the range of environmental exposures that have changed how we have, uh, that have changed the interaction between our immune system and our microbes that we evolved with for millions of preceding years. These include some obvious things like diet or the environment that surrounds us, where we live and work, um, antimicrobial exposures that have evolved a great deal since the, the 1950s, but then also some less obvious ones, like certainly probiotics, other pharmaceutical exposures, but even how we're born, how we age, or things like our daily stress levels that can modify how our immune system interacts with, with our natural microbes. So the microbiome provides a high-dimensional readout of uh, human health and of molecular activity in, in much the same way that, say, human genetics or human gene expression can. Um, this can be used to do things like predict disease risk or disease prognosis. But unlike these other readouts, the microbiome has the potential to be modified. So certainly antibiotics are a huge modification and there's interest in other types of more targeted modification of the microbiome to not just read out, but restore health once we figure out the right ways in which to do it. So that's one of the main goals of our research. And one of the main tools that's used by us and the, the entire microbiome research community is high throughput sequencing. And again, this has really aided the past several years renaissance in, in microbial community studies. 
to give a quick overview of how sequencing is used as, as one of the molecular tools for microbial community studies. Any such study, be it the, of the human microbiome or otherwise, starts with typically a culture-independent sample of microbes and uh, lyses the cells, breaks them open to extract nucleotides, DNA, or increasingly RNA to understand microbial transcription as well as microbial genomes. There are two common types of sequencing that are used for microbial community studies. The first of which I'll refer to as amplicon sequencing relies on PCR to amplify a single marker gene from within this entire pool of microbial DNA. Uh, this is most commonly regions of the conserved 16S RNA gene. So this is a, a gene that's carried by essentially all bacteria specifically. And by amplifying only variants of that one gene, each variant, each sequencing read, can be used to detect variants at that one position. So a very cost-effective and efficient way to use sequencing to study microbial communities. Each read just looks at changes within this one gene, and those small changes can be classified back to reference databases that tell us where they came from, which organism they came from. So this gives us essentially a microbial census in which each sample generates a list of microbes and how many reads were classified to them. So it counts how much or what percentage of each taxon, each organism, is detected per sample. An alternative to amplicon or 16S sequencing, as it's called, is metagenomic sequencing of DNA or metatranscriptomic sequencing of RNA in which you just plain sequence everything. So very much like shotgun sequencing of individual genomes, like the human genome, this type of metagenomic or metatranscriptomic sequencing generates a pile of short reads. But rather than being from a single organism, they're derived from tens or hundreds or sometimes thousands of different organisms within a community. So this can be used to give a more complete picture of an underlying microbial community at the cost of some more computational and, and data science complexity. The types of information you can then derive from this include not just quantifying which bugs are there, but figuring out what genes they might be carrying, putting to some degree those genes back together into microbial genomes, figuring out what kinds of metabolism or biochemistry is contained within those genomes, or zooming way in and looking at microbial genetics and very precise variants within those microbial communities, again, kind of like you would for, for a human genetic population study. So these two complementary types of sequencing are some of the main tools used to generate data about microbial communities in the human microbiome. And they're increasingly accompanied by a collection of other molecular data types that can be derived from microbiome samples. And when I say sample here, don't think too hard about what that might be. We'll, we'll get into the, the guts of the situation literally in a, a few slides. Between now and then, though, in addition to sequencing data, uh, microbial communities can be studied in a, a number of ways, briefly summarized here as cellular data, so including things like direct visualization through high-throughput microscopy, or sometimes culture-based method, actually growing organisms from a sample rather than treating it to culture independently, or using cell sorting methods such as flow cytometry that directly counts which cells are there. In addition to these cell-focused methods, other types of bi uh, biomolecular data typically derived from microbial communities include mass spec results such as uh, metabolomic or proteomic quantification. And these can then accompany the two types of amplicon or metagenome and metatranscriptome sequencing described on the, the previous slide. The types of information that one can get out of these sequencing data in particular include things like taxonomic profiling, in other words, figuring out which bugs are there, like we described for amplicon sequencing, or there are ways to zoom in on specific variants within amplicon to identify not just which organisms, but which exact strain, which exact type of each microbe is present in a community. These are both possible from amplicon sequencing, which again looks at just one uh, gene, one locus, or one uh, uh, source of variation in a microbial community. Metagenomes and metatranscriptomes can generate additional complementary data, such as functional profiling, which again quantifies the genes or pathways 
present in a collection of communities, or in addition to taxonomic profiling and variant haplotyping like Amplicon data can generate, metagenomes can provide assemblies, so either whole or, or sometimes partial microbial genomes derived directly from uh, culture-independent communities. And these genomes can also tell you about which bugs, biochemistry, or strain variation are present. So finally, from all of these different data types, these can be, they can be carried downstream for integration, different types of statistics or visualization, and these include things like uh, molecular epidemiology, associating changes in the microbiome with covariates, health outcomes, disease status, environmental exposures. Um, further analyses can be performed focusing on molecular biology or biochemistry, what pathways are microbes using to generate small molecules that affect our guts or our systemic health? Um, computa or comparative genomics or phylogenetics, so zooming in on which strains are present, how they evolve, how things like antibiotics might affect microbial selection in the entire microbiome. Or finally, things like systems biology or biophysical models, looking at the dynamics of community change using combinations of these data. So I'll touch on several of these different data analysis types from multiple different types of microbiome data today, using mainly examples from the Human Microbiome Project. Um, this will include both what uh, is commonly referred to as the Human Microbiome Project, or HMP now, uh, which I'll refer to as HMP1, um, having wrapped up a, a few years ago now. So the HMP1 uh, was an NIH-funded project to define a baseline of normal human microbial variation. Um, unlike our genomes, which are 99.9% .9 plus similar from person to person, and the last few variants obviously matter quite a bit, our microbiomes rarely overlap by more than 10% from person to person. There's a huge amount of normal baseline variation in what microbes we carry. So several years ago now, the HMP1 set out in a, quote, healthy or, or baseline population to define the bounds of this normal variation, or really to just understand who's there, which microbes are present, in what configuration, in the absence of perturbations from disease. So after wrapping up in, in 2012, the HMP1 provided sort of a baseline catalog to contextualize disease-associated variations in the microbiome. Those were further studied by the HMP2, or integrative HMP, uh, which is just recently wrapping up, and this had more of a functional mandate from the NIH to analyze the biology and, and specifically functional molecular biology of both the microbiome and host interactions dynamically over time and with a focus on disease in addition to this, quote, healthy baseline. So the HMP2 consisted of three main projects with three specific disease targets. I'll speak today about our work in inflammatory bowel disease, um, and this project was accompanied by two others in the HMP2 on pregnancy and preterm birth at Virginia Commonwealth and type 2 diabetes and obesity at Stanford and Jackson Labs. Um, as you'll see in, in several slides, all of these projects' data are available through a data coordination center uh, run at the, at the University of Maryland. So to speak a little bit to inflammatory bowel disease as a, an environment in which to study the microbiome, it's been a model for different types of gut microbial dysbiosis for a surprisingly long period of time. So even before the recent burst of work in, in human microbiome studies, you can go back many decades and find uh, language in publications that's surprisingly modern with respect to describing how the gut microbiome is perturbed in a complex way in inflammatory bowel disease. And so IBV became a model for microbiome studies over the course, again, of several decades, starting in the 1940s and 1950s when the disease was observed to be sometimes responsive to antibiotic treatment, but without a single isolatable or culturable pathogen that seemed to be causative. This continued over the subsequent few decades as other types of treatments were introduced, um, 5 ASAs and nephalazine that are still common uh, treatments for um, inflammatory bowel diseases, which affect gut microbes without being explicitly antimicrobial, but also without targeting a single causative pathogen. 
And then finally, in the 1970s and 80s, as genetically modified mice were introduced, several of them recapitulate IBD-like phenotypes with a disrupted gut microbiome. So again, without a single organism that could be blamed for this, this disease. And then in the past decade or so, as sequencing has become such a common tool to better understand how the gut microbiome is disrupted in IBD, things progressed fairly rapidly from early observations of reduced diversity or dysbiosis, so just lacking the typical range of microbes found in the gut, through identifying which organisms become more or less abundant during IBD, to finally starting to differentiate how these affect the main subsets of inflammatory bowel disease. So these include things like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and you'll see some more details about these on the, the next few slides. So in terms of how these data can be analyzed, you can again compare a lot about these sort of complex disruptions in the microbiome to complex human genetics. So if you think about infectious disease or Mendelian human genetic disease, these are both due to a single cause of large effect. So a genetic disorder like cystic fibrosis really comes from a single locus, and that causes most of the disease effect. On the microbial side, a, a, a parallel would be a pathogen, so something like cholera that's really caused by a single organism of large effect. There's, there's been a great deal of work on complex human genetics in the past two decades, and these include traits and diseases that are caused not by one locus of large effect, but by the synergistic effects of many genes or pathways working together. And this seems to be the case in complex microbial dysbioses as well, in which there's not a single pathogen, but a functional consequence of many bugs or the normal ecology of the gut or other parts of the human microbiome becoming disrupted. So to better understand these disruptions in inflammatory bowel disease during the HMP2, uh, we worked with Romnick Xavier's group at the, the Broad to put together a cohort of just over 100 individuals who were followed for one year each, consisting about half of Crohn's disease patients, a quarter of ulcerative colitis patients, and about a quarter of non-IBD controls. The cohort was recruited from a series of different clinical centers, roughly half adult and half pediatric. Um, and these very generous uh, patients contributed stool samples every two years, or sorry, every two weeks for one year. Um, these were our primary sample type with which to study the gut microbiome, in addition to colon biopsies collected at enrollment and blood draws collected roughly quarterly. So from these three different sample types, we were able to get a whole set of different data, um, much of the stool-derived stool data um, de describe the microbiome, mainly using sequencing, metagenomics and metatranscriptomics, in addition to a series of other molecular data types, metabolomics and proteomics from mass spec, like I mentioned earlier, a subset of virally targeted sequencing, and then some host-targeted measures from the stool samples, including calprotectin, which is a, a protein measure of gut inflammation. Our biopsies and blood draws provided mostly human-focused data, um, some of which was, again, sequencing, including um, uh, exome sequencing of the, the human hosts, epigenetic bisulfate sequencing of methylation both right in the gut from the biopsies and in circulating blood, and then a couple of other non-sequencing data types there, including serology from the blood, so antibody markers uh, in circulating blood, and finally 16S, or amplicon sequencing of microbes, again, directly in the gut from these biopsy samples. So you can see from these numbers down the side that there are several thousand samples touching many different data types describing, um, as, as mandated, both microbial and host changes over time during IBD. Um, to give a, an overview of how this broke down over both time and the, the uh, individuals within the populations, for each phenotype, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and our control individuals, we had a subpopulation that was very densely sampled, so uh, generating data from almost every sample provided over the course of the year, and then subpopulations that were targeted to specific aligned time points. What this allowed us to do was generate multi-omic data um, to integrate as many of these different data types as possible over time. So this complicated uh, subway diagram here is essentially a, a Venn diagram listing the overlap 
between these different data types, anchored off of metagenomic sequencing, for which we had a total of, of just under 1,700 samples. And most of these overlapped with one or more other molecular data types. So I won't go through the, the details here, but for example, essentially all of the metatranscriptome sequ uh, uh, sequence data sets were drawn from the same samples as a metagenome. Um, essentially all of the metaproteomic and metabolomic samples were also drawn from underlying metagenomes, and so forth and so forth, down to roughly 300 samples for which we have all six of these microbially targeted um, data types from the same sample time points and individuals. So this gives us an opportunity to look at how each measurement of the microbiome changes over time and how they integrate with each other cross-sectionally and dynamically. So all of these data are being made available as they're generated. Essentially, all of them are online currently at the IBD Multiomics Database, or IBD MDB portal, um, in addition to the main HMP data coordinating center that I mentioned earlier. The IBD MDB has a little more focused information for, for our project in particular, including all of the protocols that we used for sample collection and data generation. Um, so if you're interested in doing your own study and really want to collect thousands of stool samples, there's a protocol describing how we did that using a, a home-based kit that could be dropped in the mail and, and shipped in. And then, of course, all of the raw and processed data are being made available on, on the IBD MDB as well, along with uh, the clinical metadata describing um, these patients, their medical histories, their medication, and how these change over the, the course of a year. To show a few first looks at how we've been integrating some of these different molecular data types in the, the HMP2, I'll show an example first of, of work comparing the gut metagenome to the gut metatranscriptome. So in other words, the collection of DNA that's present in, in microbes during IBD and the collection of RNA or their transcriptional activity in the gut. So this is an example from uh, one pathway N-acetylglucosamine degradation, which is a, a type of mucus metabolism carried out by a subset of gut microbes. Each column here represents the distribution of which organisms are expressing transcriptionally this pathway across a subset of one of our pilot data sets within the HMT2. So there's a smaller number of samples here, obviously. In almost every individual, Bacteries vulgatus, a specific species that's, that's common in the gut, is uniquely responsible for this type of mucus metabolism. And when we look at this, not just cross-sectionally, but longitudinally, that's true within most subjects over time as well. So when we take one patient's four time points that we have in, in this uh, uh, pilot data set, at each time point, Bacteries vulgatus is both the only organism carrying this pathway in its genome and the only organism transcribe, essentially the only organism transcribing it. So this is likely the bug responsible for this particular portion of mucus metabolism in the gut for this individual. But that's not true for all patients. So if we go to another individual with more active disease, Bacteria vulgatus is typically the dominant organism carrying this pathway in its DNA, but other organisms take over that functionality at different points in time. So even very rare organisms can become responsible for this type of biochemistry transiently. So in the second time point, a different factory, Xylema solvens, has taken over a, a plurality of the pathway. In the third time point, Bacteries mesoliensis has taken over, and so forth. As this patient goes through more active changes in their, their uh, ulcerative colitis status, the organisms carrying this pathway don't change but the organisms carrying out this activity, the organisms transcribing this particular mucus metabolism pathway change uh, from time point to time point. So this could reflect a, a, an aspect of instability in the gut microbiome corresponding to disease activity that's not necessarily visible in just measuring the DNA, but which can be seen in which bugs are carrying out a pathway transcriptomically. This seems to be a general principle within the gut, not just uh, true in disease activity, but even at baseline, if we compare which organisms can contribute all pathways to which organisms are actively transcribing them. So here on the y-axis, each point represents one pathway, just like this overall plot does, boiled down to a single point. 
on the y-axis um, is the diversity of how many organisms can contribute a pathway. On the x-axis is the diversity of how many organisms are transcribing that pathway. Everything is above the diagonal, which is good. You expect more bugs to carry a pathway than to activate it at any given time. <coughs> Excuse me. And what's interesting here is that in the lower left are the more unique pathways, those that are only carried by a few bugs. If you look at the coloring, this corresponds to how actively transcribed that pathway is. And these tend to light up. So the more unique a functionality is, the more it tends to be overexpressed. Another example of this in a different organism is methanogenesis. Um, this is a pathway that's really only uh, present in a very few bugs, the archaea in the gut, and it can be overexpressed by as much as a hundredfold. So those few bugs that can perform that specific biochemistry tend to work really hard at it. They're carrying out their particular function, their particular niche in the gut. We can perform this type of uh, multi-omic data comparison for other combinations of molecular data in the microbiome as well. So that example compared metagenomes to metatranscriptomes in one of our pilot data sets. We can do something similar comparing metagenomes to metabolomes or the abundances of different small molecules in, our, in the gut and the, the stool samples from the HMV2. So this is a slightly different pilot data set, again, not including the, the full final sample set. But here, we've measured, in addition to metagenomes, the abundances of about four or 500 identified compounds and several thousand unidentified compounds um, in collaboration with Clary Klisch's group at the, the Broad Institute. So this plot summarizes the classes and number of each class of compounds that are individually enriched or depleted in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, very much like the microbial enrichments or depletions in IBD that I, I mentioned earlier. But where things get more interesting is when we start integrating these small molecule chemical changes with the microbial changes. This plot shows the correlation <coughs> of organisms that are either enriched or depleted during inflammatory bowel disease with small molecules, chemicals, that are enriched in the gut or depleted during inflammatory bowel disease. So each cell in the heat map correlates a bug with a compound, and this is after correcting for a variety of covariates, so things like subject age, antibiotic exposure, or even disease activity itself. So even though these are bugs and compounds that are disrupted in disease, We've tried to regress out as much of that effect as we can so we can instead look at microbial biochemical covariation. What this then means when a bug and a, a, or what it suggests when a bug and a small molecule covary this strongly across the population is that there might be something mechanistic going on. This could be a compound that a positively correlated organism generates biochemically or it could be a compound that covaries because this bug depends on it as a nutrient. Or alternatively, an organism might ecologically interact with another organism that generate or generates or depends on this compound. <coughs> and some of these covariations are so strong, we find a lot of very striking correlations between microbes and very specific compounds. Some of these are so strong that we can do some gazing into the metagenome to help explain mechanistically why these, these uh, observational correlations might be happening. An example of that, uh, we'll see an example of that from Ruminococcus navis, specifically in a, a few slides, but it's surprising how often these correlations happen for um, unintuitive reasons. There's a, a theme that I'll come back to a, a couple of times is that there's a lot we don't know about microbial biochemistry in the wild, in the gut and in other parts of, of the human microbiome. So when we go looking for known enzymes, annotated microbial genes that are known to generate or metabolize specific compounds, we find very few cases in which we can correlate a known enzyme with the compound that it generates or consumes. There are a few of these examples with ethanolamine or glutathione, for example, and these are annotations of the enzymes responsible for processing those compounds across samples and in a variety of different organisms, but these are the exceptions rather than the rules. 
And if, if there are microbiologists in the audience and you look closely at this slide, you can actually guess why this might be happening in as much as there's a lot of green. So the color here indicates which organisms are contributing these enzymes in each of the three phenotypes, IBD, uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and controls. And if you compare the enrichment for these organisms to the, the legend below, you can see that green is actually E. coli, which is one of the best annotated organisms where we do know quite a bit of biochemistry and we can assign biochemical function to many of its genes. But there are very few cases where we can find this specific of information so far. So even though we can identify genes that co-vary with compounds, they may be completely unannotated. So there's a lot of, of biochemistry left to discover there. We can, just from a purely computational or machine learning perspective, use those unannotated genes or compounds to ask questions about IBD more broadly. So for example, it's, it's fairly easy to fairly well differentiate the IBD gut from a control microbiome, so from non-IBD or, quote, healthy controls. So using, in this case, a random forest classifier, but this is true for essentially any uh, discriminative machine learning algorithm, we can separate individuals with and without IBD with fairly good accuracy using either a measurement of which chemicals are there, a measurement of which bugs are there, or it's not on this plot. We can do the same thing using a measure of which genes are there. The classification task gets a little bit harder when we differentiate subtypes of IBD. So for example, separating ulcerative colitis from Crohn's disease drops the accuracy a little bit. But what I think is interesting about this result is that the machine learner can do roughly as well, whether it's learning from chemicals or which organisms are present in the microbiome, or again, not, not shown here, but the same is true for genes and pathways in the microbiome, which again points to the very tight link between which bugs and which biochemical DNA is present, which enzymes are present in the gut, and the metabolite pools that we observe through the metabolomic profiling of the gut microbiome. So finally, to get to one more specific example of this, by zooming further into that, that Ruminococcus navis example I mentioned earlier, we have a third pilot data set from within the HMP, uh, within the HMP2 that, that I'll use for this example, which compared specifically the dense, longer longitudinal time courses um, across Crohn's disease, and are a subset of the control uh, subject. So in taking a look at this uh, longitudinal data set, what Brantley and Miranda, the postdocs uh, who worked on this project did, was ask questions about the functionality of microbes that were changing in IBD, or in Crohn's disease specifically, over time. And one of the things that they found that's, that's been suggested by metagenomic profiling earlier is that there are more commonalities in the types of biochemistry that gets perturbed during IBD than in the specific organisms. And one example of this is the class of facultative anaerobes or aerotolerant microbes in the gut tend to be enriched in IBD. And the, the causality for this could go either way. So this could either be a function of more oxygen being present in the gut during inflammation and allowing these bugs to grow or these bugs being pro-inflammatory and, and sort of causing the inflammation and, and the IBD in the first place. So you can see this enrichment for a whole group of different organisms, either when comparing the Crohn's and control individuals from within this HMT2 pilot data set, or when comparing it to other external gut microbiome data sets, including the healthy population in the HMT1, or another Crohn's disease study carried out at, at um, University of Pennsylvania, individual organisms may not show such a strong enrichment during inflammation, but the entire class of aerotolerant organisms does. And you can see this when we zoom into Ruminococcus navis as a representative of this group of organisms. It's weakly enriched individually, but the overall functional enrichment is uh, a lot more statistically significant. What's interesting about Ruminococcus navis, though, is that one of the reasons it's so hard to see this enrichment in an individual organism is that it's not the whole organism that seems to be associated with inflammatory bowel disease and, and inflammation in the microbiome. It's only certain strains of Ruminococcus navis. 
So what you're looking at here is on each column is one sample from either a Crohn's disease or control individual who did carry Ruminococcus mavis in their gut. And you can see there's a small number of control individuals who are carrying Ruminococcus mavis. But there are about 200 genes, and that's what each row represents, that were only carried by the strains of microbes, the strains of Ruminococcus mavis present in the IBD gut. And we can put biochemical annotations on a small set of these genes. Some of them deal with aerotolerance and oxidative stress management. Others correspond to more pathogen or pathobiont-like functions like adhesion or invasion. Um, and others have really interesting metabolic annotation like uh, iron utilization. But the vast majority are, again, unannotated. They don't have um, good homology to other, uh, other well-characterized enzymes out in reference databases. So in as much as I'll, I'll again come back to this uh, a few times, it's a microbiological or biochemical challenge to figure out what these genes do. But I, I would, as a computational biologist, I would also frame it as a, a data management challenge. So a lot of low-hanging fruit in using slightly more intelligent algorithms than just plain homology to start getting an idea of what some of this microbial dark matter that seems functionally significant in the microbiome might be doing. So with that in mind, I'll, I'll spend some of the, the rest of the time on, on what you can think of as the other HMD2 or a second wave of analysis carried out in the, quote, healthy or baseline population of the HMP1. So to help differentiate this population, I'll, I'll refer to examples from this study as the HMP1-2. So this was a set of similarly flavored analyses carried out on metagenomes from the HMP1 healthy population. And so I, I introduced this briefly earlier, but to, to go into a little bit more detail of how the HMP1 defined a, a baseline microbiome, this population included 300, quote, healthy subjects who were screened at five different body areas for a fairly high and specific degree of clinical health. So very few um, oral health or oral hygiene issues. There was a specific BMI range that had to be followed, no skin abrasions, for example. And this allowed up to 18 different body sites to be sampled, not just the gut, um, but a series of nasal, many different oral sites across the mouth, a few different skin sites, again, stool representing the gut, and a series of different vaginal microbiome samples in women. Um, the HMP1 and 1-2 included three different visits to get a little bit of longitudinal information for this population as well, um, as, as well as, again, metadata describing the demographics and, and background and, and environment of these individuals. So the initial set of information published with the HMP1 several years ago focused mainly on the several thousand amplicon samples that were analyzed across essentially all of these samples that were collected. For the HMP1-2, more recently, we uh, just finished analysis of about 2,400 metagenomes uh, across a subset of these individuals and body sites, but now spanning roughly all three time points for all individuals and this subset of six representative body sites from the different areas. So I'll talk about some of the results from that. I think some of the interesting data challenges here was certainly wrangling this large a set of metagenomes, performing things like quality control, raw um, bioinformatics on the, the metagenomic sequencing data, and metagenomic assembly was greatly facilitated by, again, Owen White's team at the Data Coordinating Center, um, who uh, are doing this as part of the NIH Data Commons project in addition to the, the HMP2. What we could then get out of that is not just more data than we had in the HMP1, but a series of updated analyses, including very specific functional profiling that we'll see in a few slides, very specific taxonomic profiling down to the tracking of individual strains, and I'll describe some of the computing behind that as well. And then a few things I, I won't have time for today, including non-bacterial profiling, fungi and viruses, the updated assemblies that I mentioned, um, gene catalog is derived from these assemblies, and then a little bit about the multiple time point dynamics that I, I will describe the analysis methods for. But to start with some of the easy views of what this information can tell you, is to start at a 30,000 foot view of the overall human microbiome, 
um, these metagenomic profiles now show much the same information that was available from the Amplicon data originally in the HMP1, in which many of the largest differences in the human microbiome across the body um, are derived from the, the body site itself. Bugs care about their immediate biochemical environment. Microbes are essentially little bags of biochemistry. So when you ask, well, what are the biggest differences across the human microbiome, the first answer is the immediate environment, the body site is the, that a collection of microbes likes to live in. So that means when we put these 2,400 metagenomes together, most of the variation that we can see at a high level derives from this, the different body sites from which the samples are derived. The gut is a very unique environment. It tends to carry a, a different microbial ecology. The same is true for skin. Um, the vaginal microbiome sites were quite similar to each other, but distinct from the other microbial environment sampled here. And then I mentioned there were multiple different oral body sites, which you can see here in the kind of cool colors, and a continuum in which we can actually, and I'll show some examples later, differentiate fairly specific locations within the oral cavity, such as the tooth surface, the cheek, or the tongue, which were the three main oral body sites studied here. This is a very high level view in which each point represents a sample and the distance between points represents how dissimilar they are. But of course, this is supported by very detailed information underneath, both per sample listing which organisms are there and their abundances, and as we'll see in a, a few slides, differentiating those organisms into specific streams as well. The first analysis I want to describe using the information about these taxonomic profiles, though, um, was in, in characterizing how they changed over time. This was something new within the HMP12 and, and uses um, what I think was an interesting data analysis method for this type of data, specifically Gaussian processes. Um, so you can think of a, a Gaussian process as, as a probabilistic uh, functional regression, so a way of fitting a curve probabilistically to a series of measurements over time which is exactly what we have here. We have a series of uh, multiple time points measured for the microbiome, each measuring a collection of organisms in different individuals and in different body sites. So we wanted to ask how different organisms were changing over time across the body within the microbiome. And Gaussian processes gave us a way to do that by decomposing each of these set of changes into a couple of, of specific mechanisms. So specifically, we built a set of Gaussian processes to model microbial change as a combination of stable inter-individual differences, so bugs that are just always different between people and their abundances depend on who you are, not what time it is, microbes that vary steadily over time. And these are organisms that might, for example, be responsive to long-term dietary perturbations or long-term medical, uh, um, pharmaceutical interventions, so things like antibiotics. And then finally, since we had a series of technical replicates, we could differentiate between microbes that change rapidly on their own biologically versus those that have measurement error and have essentially technical noise. So you can think of this as rapid change and this as, as uh, measurement error. So by fitting probabilistically this um, hierarchical Gaussian process, to our longitudinal data, we can describe each bug in terms of these three properties of interest. Does it differ stably between individuals? Does it change slowly over time? Or does it change rapidly over time? So these three locations in the plot I'm about to, to show correspond to these three temporal patterns. Stab the stability between individuals, slow temporal change, and rapid temporal change. And we can then plot over this simplex each organism, or it turns out, and I, I won't show it today, but you can do the same thing for pathways within a particular body site. So here we've broken down the gut microbiome in the healthy population of the HMP12 based on these temporal behaviors. And you can immediately see some consistency in what different microbes are doing. The bacteroides, which are uh, uh, one of the dominant groups of bugs in the gut, tend to be stable within individuals over time. Some people will have one bacteroides and some people will have a different type of bacteroides. These blue dots represent another major group of organisms in the gut, the firmicutes, and they tend overall to show more 
slow variation. So this might include things like diet responsiveness. And then finally, a subset of more opportunistic organisms like E. coli change rapidly over time. They can grow or die off or grow again very quickly in response to a changing environment. So zooming in to a slightly higher level of taxonomic information, we can profile not just which organisms are present in the, the gut microbiome, but which strains of each organism are, are, are present. And a, a, one, a quick one slide summary of, of one of the computational methods for doing this relies on mapping the short reads within a metagenome to a collection of pre-specified unique marker sequences for each species. So for this particular uh, tool called strain plan, uh, we take a collection of reference sequence information, we identify the most unique sequences for each species, and then given a new metagenome, we can map those short reads to just these unique markers and call snippet variants within those confidently identified markers. This allows for each species and each sample the construction of a strain level haplotype, a set of variants unique to the, the strain of that species in each sample. And these can then be visualized in a, a number of different ways, some of which are exactly the same as you would do for microbial genetics in a collection of isolates by looking at the phylogeny or divergence between strains in different samples. You can associate these with phenotypes. So for example, if this is the phylogeny of the strains of one organism across many different gut microbiomes, this set of strains is enriched for the, the cartoon red phenotype, and this set of strains is enriched for the purple phenotype. Equivalently, you can show the same type of information, again, in an ordination like we saw earlier, but here each point represents the strain of a particular species in one metagenome, and distance between points represents how diverged genetically those strains are. So using that, we can both associate strains with phenotype, like I showed on the previous slide, or ask some basic biological questions about how strains evolve in the human microbiome in the first place. So one of the ways in which we did this was by comparing the genetic diversity of organisms within each body site to the diversity between body sites. Some organisms like to specialize to a particular biochemical environment and essentially diverge into different organisms across body sites, whereas other organisms transfer genetic material more freely and, and are more cosmopolitan. And you can see this better with some examples, where if I take a point that's right on this diagonal, the diversity of strep salivarius between and within body sites is roughly the same. So each point here represents one strain of strep salivarius from a number of different body sites. You can see there's a great deal of genetic diversity, but it doesn't really segregate within any particular part of the, the oral cavity, since this is a typically oral microbe. A counterexample is something like Haemophilus parainfluenzae, uh, which is up off the diagonal here. This organism has a comparable amount of genetic diversity but it started to differentiate into groups of strains that are unique to each of the three main oral sites. So you can actually find different types of H. player influenzae on the tooth surface versus the cheek versus the tongue. So this is the level of biochemical specialization that some microbes in the, the microbiome are able to attain. You can actually differentiate different ecological strategies genetically across very, very uh, nearby surfaces within the oral cavity. So finally, I'll wrap up not with methods for detecting who is there in the microbiome, but, but, a little, but with a little bit about um, functional profiling and understanding the, the biochemistry that we can detect from metagenomes and metatranscriptomes. So a quick one-slide summary of uh, uh, one of the methods we have to do that <coughs> starts with, again, a metagenome or metatranscriptome. And after detecting which organisms are present in the sample using the, the methods I described earlier, retrieves their reference sequences from an underlying database. So not just the unique markers or the most uh, specific sequences, but all genes or the pan genome associated with each organism in a community, maps metagenomic or metatranscriptomic reads to those genes, counts up hits, 
and can thereby describe which genes and which organisms are carrying them in a community. And then finally, for reads that do not map to specific nucleotides, we carry out a, a more computationally expensive translated search. Hits from this process to a larger protein database can still tell you something about the biochemistry of what that gene might be doing, but not necessarily which organism is carrying it. So this gives a functional profile of a microbial community in which we can quantify very much like you would for, say, a, a transcriptomics or RNA-seq, the abundance of each gene family in the community in units that are basically like RPKMs uh, or relative abundances. And these are broken down when possible into the contributing organism for each gene family or into an, a set of unclassified organisms when we only know that the protein level of the gene family is there. For the subset of these gene families that are biochemically characterized, we can also put them back together into pathways and do the same thing to quantify and taxonomically annotate the contributions of each pathway to a community in addition to the uncharacterized gene families. So I'm running a little low on time. I'll move quickly through the last few examples of using this within the human microbiome, including things like finding human-specific pathways. So pathways that are carried microbially across many different biochemical environments on the body. And these speak to processes that are enriched in host-associated microbes. So things that, that bugs have to do somewhere in their ecology in order to survive in association with a human being. And you can see with, uh, from this one example of vitamin B metabolism on the bottom here, that across the body, many different organisms might carry out this process but it seems to be necessary for it to be carried out by some organism within the community to form a stable ecology. And this is in addition, of course, to body site or biochemically specific processes that are carried out by different bugs within a specific environment. So for example, nitrate reduction is always carried out by some organism in the oral cavity, but this can again be a different organism from person to person or, or mouth to mouth in this case. So this type of functional profiling gives us sort of an, a, a way of linking ecology and biochemistry in the microbiome by looking at the diversity of organisms that can provide a pathway both within an individual or between individuals, ranging from pathways that are more or less core to the human microbiome, they must be present in every individual in some environment, Sometimes, rarely, these are provided by a specific organism, and that organism is the same between individuals. But more commonly, there's diversity in which organisms can provide a particular type of biochemistry. So here's an example in which only one organism per individual tends to provide a pathway, but that organism can differ between individuals. And then finally, more typically, there can be many different microbes per individual that can carry out a particular type of biochemistry, and often it's not even the same bugs per individual. So there can be diversity both in which organisms per individual provide a pathway and in how they change between individuals. So this leads us to, to some of the challenges in, in um, microbial community and human microbiome uh, analysis and data science, which range all the way from the very molecular focus that I was just describing up to higher level questions of population health and, and microbial interactions. I highlighted already a lot of the, the dark matter or open questions around the underlying biochemistry or cellular biology that we can see in the microbiome from these different types of molecular data. And of course, many of these affect translation in human health. As I mentioned at the beginning, the microbiome provides not just a high dimensional readout of human health, but also a potential point of intervention. Once we know the right direction in which to push it, we can make changes to a microbial community in a way that it would be very difficult with human genetics. And finally, many of these human health considerations have um, effects at the population level as well. So for example, early life, antimicrobial or probiotic exposures might then influence microbiome acquisition or development and thus later life um, uh, allergic or atopic phenotypes as well.
So all of the tools that I've, I've briefly mentioned today are available online as part of the, the lab's uh, BioBakery collection, both of individual open source methods and a, a virtual image that includes all of these pre-built and documented and set up within a, a single environment. So if you're interested in, in follow-up work using any of these methods, uh, take a look at the, the BioBakery site. And I'd like to thank all of those faces that you saw going by who are the, the people who actually did the work either in the lab or uh, several of our collaborators. Much of this work was, was with Romney Xavier at the, the Broad. I mentioned Owen and uh, Newt Marker's uh, group at the University of Maryland, Wendy Garrett uh, here at the School of Public Health, and then several former lab members, uh, such as Nicola Sagata, who have since gone on to um, carry on a, a great deal of this work on their, their own. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. Again, thank the, the organizers, the audience, and I think there's a little time left for questions. Curtis, this was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. This is really, I've got about 4,000 questions and in five minutes to ask them in. Um, but I wanted to just, these are some questions of my own. And as somebody who's not a microbiomicist, um, uh, this is fascinating for me. And when I, back in the olden days, uh, when I was learning about genetics, there was a, a real emphasis, um, at least, uh, kind of during the initial phases of the, the, the microbiological uh, um, genomics uh, kind of uh, explosion, there was still a lot of interest in doing population genetics and looking at um, things like gene fitness and, um, you know, as genes uh, propagate through a distribution and whatnot. Is there any sort of, in your opinion, um, opportunities for those old school population geneticist mathematicians to take a look at some of these data and look at gene frequencies and some of these uh, different populations and, and what happens uh, to those genes as they spread through populations and either are beneficial or otherwise? Does that make sense? It, it makes sense. It's a, a great question and very timely. Um, one, one of the things I think has been exciting about the past year's worth of, of computational biology in the microbiome is the ability to see that kind of, of data at sufficient resolution to do sort of classical microbial genetics in a, a culture independent or metagenomic way. Um, so some of these strain identification methods, for example, have only just recently become precise enough to track strain variation and divergence and population genetics for every bug in a community at the same time. And we're starting to, to get to the 10 thousands of gut microbiome samples available globally to do that sort of tracking across multiple populations simultaneously. So yeah, I think, I think that is, yeah, that was a that good is thing so, to be doing. It's so exciting because, you know, when you're talking about, you know, population genetics, at least, you know, the, uh, um, uh, Cavalli, Sforza, and Bodmer type of old school population genetics, you know, that was all like very theoretical, right? Lots of differential equations to try to theoretically analyze what would happen if a gene spread through a population to fixation and Hardy-Weinberg equilibriums and so forth and so on. But you actually have the population of bugs to you know analyze and watch what happens as a new gene gets introduced into that population and what happens to it and be able to watch the behavior of the bugs, um, watch their biochemical output as a consequence of as these genes spread through that population, what happens to them and uh, is that beneficial or not? And I was also thinking about something that you had mentioned about the specificity of the different bugs for their various niches on the body where you have, say, you know, something that lives on the skin is not necessarily the same population of bugs which live inside the, the gut. And I was also curious about, because um, it looked like you were sort of talking about, I don't know if you touched on it uh, in particular, but immune responses to when, say, something that's even from an, an individual, something like bugs from their gut get introduced accidentally into a different area of the body. So I was thinking in my head, like, what happens when, because, you know, for those of us who've had kids, what happens when bugs from the gut get introduced into the eye? And this is basically pink eye, right? So you basically get gut bugs introduced into the conjunctiva of the eye, and you get an immune response of swelling and pus and all sorts of other nastiness. And, you know, there's a really dramatic and obvious immune response. Can you Im imagine being able to look at the role of the immune system in all of this? 
Definitely, it's it's much more I should say Wendy's area of expertise uh, than than mine. Um, but but we work with her and and Romnick on immune interactions quite a bit. Um, in in the gut, the the kind of example that you raised come comes up in the the context of of gut barrier leakiness and the degree to which, again, in a sort of cyclical way. Um, post-triggered inflammation um, can allow microbial penetration through through the gut, um, and then conversely, microbial in, uh, if, uh, invasion can trigger inflammation and uh, sustain that leakiness. Um, so that certainly is a factor in, in inflammatory bowel disease. Systemically, there's there's interest, and we've we've worked with uh, folks like Dan Lippman on rheumatoid arthritis, where certainly either leakiness or perturbation in the gut or potentially circulation or, or triggers from distal microbes um, like oral microbes could play a factor in sort of mistriggering the, the immune system systemically and then having it target things like, like the synovium at, at uh, joints in rheumatoid arthritis. That's really fascinating. And one final question is, can you give us a comment on um, microbial transplantation um, and what sort of uh, horizons uh, exist for that? Well, it's a, a great question and, and you know, every, everyone likes to talk about poop transplants at the, at the end of a talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. But there's, there's uh, I, I would certainly put the fecal microbiome transplants in um, one of the, the real translational success stories of the, the microbiome so far. Uh, so far. Um, certainly for Clostridium difficile, there's been a lot of great results in properly screened and clinically controlled transplants being able to uh, really ameliorate recurrent C. diff. And there's starting to be more work in FMTs for inflammatory bowel disease where the ecology is harder to restore. Again, we don't necessarily know yet what the right push is to, to give to the community to, to get it back to stability within an individual. And there's a lot of subject-to-subject -subject variation. So I think some of the, the neatest work going on in that space right now is in understanding, one, what is the best push to give to, say, an ulcerative colitis individual? What's the right group of microbes? Whether that should come from a, an FMT or whether you can make an artificial cocktail that, that behaves like an FMT. And then, two, how to tailor that to each individual so that no matter what their sort of current or baseline microbiome is, that push gets them, them back to a healthy state. And that's where things like, again, strain tracking and understanding the biochemistry or functional profile of what these bugs should be doing is, is helpful. Well, with that, I'd like to uh, thank Curtis Suttenhauer from uh, Harvard Medical School or School of Public Health, excuse me, um, for his a fantastic talk. I'm just uh, uh, so uh, just blown away. Um, I have about a, still another several thousand questions, um, but we've run out of time. Um, but uh, thank you, Curtis. That was really fantastic. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, for those who've been asking, uh, this is being recorded and will be uh, available online here a little later today. So uh, if you want to rewatch it um, or share it with friends, please, uh, by all means, do. And uh, once again, let me thank you for uh, tuning in to the Big Data to Knowledge Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science. Uh, please look forward to um, uh, future uh, lectures that we'll be having here in the coming weeks. Thanks again. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody.